Wake up, guys! New monsters just dropped again. This is Fragments of Silicon. Welcome to a new installment of Fragments of Silicon, the first in, you know, two weeks, at least proper episode. You know, the reviews obviously review, uh, resume first, but, you know, uh, I'll get into the whole impromptu hiatus in, a, in the new segment, but, or at least my new segment. But uh, let's get to my colleagues' this is a particular news items. Uh, Galax, why don't you start us off this week? Uh, I don't have too much. Um, looking forward to Splatoon 3 this weekend, and also uh, some of the new stuff they revealed for Pokemon Scarlet and Violet looks pretty neat. Although there are still some things that I still have some questions about. Um, like why they ripped off Mega Man Battle Network for some of the new monster designs? Uh, a little bit, I guess. <laughs> it's not, I don't think they're bad, though. I didn't they're just, say they it, were, it, but it's just yeah. funny they look like they ripped off Battle Network. They look more like Cyber Elves from Zero to me, but that's just because I have particularly the Knight Cyber Elf that deletes all minor enemies in a stage mm -hmm. uh, as one of my favorite designs um but yes yeah, one of those things they do kind of look like um let's see uh macross on the weekends with mac went well um thankfully the weather is less hot it's getting to be fallish i think we're not getting out early on the weekends at work after last weekend. Uh, on Fridays, rather. Um, yeah, not all, uh, pretty uneventful, I guess. I've been tired lately, and I'm not sure exactly why, but some of it's probably because it was raining a lot the last few days. All right. Uh, any fan? Yeah, it's your go. All righty. Uh, overall, n not too much to report. I have been feeling kind of, I guess, blarg. I've been having some abdominal pain that's, like, mildly concerning, but since I'm not having a fever, even if I did go to ER, the worst they'd probably do it, or the best they'd probably do is maybe give me some pain meds and tell me to follow up with my GP. So, hmm. unless I start developing a fever, it's probably just my IBS acting up. So, that's fun. Also, it seems I have misplaced my copy of Digimon Survive, which kind of sucks. Yes. Luckily, that's I've just... already beaten it, so... I at least... I know enough of the game to give it a fairly thorough review. We just Can may be, be doing it over trailer footage instead of gameplay footage. I mean, uh, you still have, like, a week and a half to find it. Yeah. That is the one thing I am not a fan of with Switch games. They are very small and easy to lose. Yeah, I still yeah, barely started my copy. Well, good thing I finished it. At least the first path. And, yeah, sorry, um, I w I w I've been trying to finish up Legends yeah. Arceus, so... Um, I've also been play playing Xenoblade uh, Chronicles 2, because I beat uh, Chronicles 1. I just finished the story, I didn't like go through and deal with the super bosses, because... Oh man, you know. did, you get the tur did you get the turbo-bugged gacha selection? Uh, 
I don't know. I you can't actually just tell easily, but uh, because of uh, I think they like misreferenced the lookup table for the charity rewards that you're supposed to get when you uh, go a long time without getting anything rare. Mm. So well, the that thing is, if, fairly if, early if, on, I got the DLC, so I rolled a bunch of legendary things, so... Mm -hmm. It's probably not, it's not, like, even a huge, like, your game sucks if this happens. It's just mm -hmm. noticeable if your gacha luck seems like super... It's super weird that that game has a complete in-game gacha system, also. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That has, like, no actual real-world monetary component. It's only in the game. Yeah, other than you get a few more <laughs> rolls if you buy the DLC, and that's it. Right. It's, it's, the, the you can't, you don't pay for them, you just get them in-game. Yeah. As but a, it's hey, still, thanks and, for getting more content. But yeah, there's supposed to be four different lists that have different rarities for the rare blades, basically. Mm -hmm. But the mercy list, or the, the charity list lookup table, whatever the fuck it's called in a gacha when you get something good because you haven't gotten anything good for like yeah. ten rolls. I think I'm at um, the point in the list where I need like the last party oh. member... To unlock mm -hmm. the rest of the gotcha list. That's possible. But yeah, one, one of the lists has a... Is misreferenced so that... Uh, because the Mercy thing, if you've already gotten the thing on the Mercy thing, it just skips it and gives you a normal thing. Mm. So one of the Mercy... One of the charity table lookups uh, misreferences the the actual table it's attached to and uh, the things that you are supposed to get for charity are things that are already common on that list. Mm. Anyway. Yeah. So, Sorry. Yeah, it's fine. Um, I, I, just, I just think weird glitches are fun. Oh, yeah. Um, but yeah, I'm not super far into two yet. I think I just got the fourth party member. Yeah, fourth. So, yeah, it's... It's been a thing. And also, um, I've... Since we started a new tier, it, raid tier in Final Fantasy XIV, I've been putting more time back into that, because I need to get equipped for the new raid tier. Hooray! Endless cycles! <laughs> Uh, and I think that's it for me. All right, I guess it's my go. And yeah, uh, let's just say I've been overstuffed with news, yeah. uh, we say at least. But I suppose the, leading in from what I was saying, uh, the reason why we took a week off is I ended up in the hospital. Like, um, in, pretty much immediately after I concluded or we concluded the uh, racing, sh the indie racing festival stream on last Sunday, or sorry, last Saturday. <laughs> I wasn't feeling too good, uh, head spinning, um, felt like I was about to pass out. So I managed to get to the hospital, and as it turns out, I had uh, low sodium, mm. like been drinking too much water, right? And so they kept me two days while they restored my uh, sodium solutions to their proper equilibrium. Eventually. <laughs> like, I say eventually because they fucked up and then they, because they ended up adding too much salt. And, you know, they were about to discharge me too when the uh, when the kidney doctor came up and said, oh, he asked why I wasn't being hooked up to the IV again, because, oh, it turns out there's too much uh, salt solution in my system, and you're now at risk of having heart problems. I'm like, yeah, this is kind of how my life has been going lately. You know, it's like, because <sighs> um, I think I might have mentioned it before, but 
um, like a few weeks back, I got diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, and I've been dealing with that. You know, like uh, just today, um, I got, or actually yesterday, I got my glucometer and the associated stuff with that. You know, they keep track of blood sugar. Um, but the doctor's office forgot me to get me the what they call the lancing pen. Um, it's the thing that you put the, um, the lance uh, for your fingers mm -hmm. into. So, you know, it's like, and, you know, I called up the office and they said, apparently you need a prescription for this and they'll send it to the Walgreens. But I go down to the Walgreens and say, um, not, they didn't get a prescription and then not even sure that's the kind of thing that's covered by a prescription or insurance. And it's like, oh, you can buy one for $13. Like, and so, and I understand that this is an, a, a relatively inexpensive device, but I'm still going to go down to the doctor's office and then to the Walgreens to get this situated because it's the principle of the matter. Because I've been told two wildly conflicting stories, and this isn't the first time this happened um, in regards to the Walgreens, because when it came to my diabetic medication, um, when the doctor's office sent the order, they apparently didn't get it over at Walgreens. And, you know, as it turns out, they didn't have my medication there until a few days later. And, yeah, the, like I said, this is the kind of shit I've been dealing with. Um, now, as far as the diabetes itself is going, um, I'm actually doing better than I was when I got diagnosed. Um, because not only do I have type 2 diabetes, but I have hypertension. So I got... Really, who doesn't these days? But I mean, I have it medically. No, okay. me, I, I, yeah, I actually was including that a lot of people have hypertension, and right. it's probably undiagnosed and even more. Well, you see also type 2 diabetes. Like, I probably had this shit for years, and in fact, that, that's how it goes. And, you know, didn't get the diagnosis until, um, well, like I said, maybe a week and a half, two weeks ago at this point. But I'm like, you know, I've already made a lot of radical alterations to my diet. Like, you know, I won't say I'm, I've been low carb free perfectly or anything like that. You know, it's still early days, and there's a lot to learn in terms of the diet, you know, in terms of what is good and bad for a diabetic. And, you know, it's a big reason why I'm looking, you know, why I'm getting a diabetic dietitian um, covered under my insurance, you know, to help navigate those waters. Also, my last food bill was a lot higher than it was. Than it has been, and let's see if I can get that reduced. Mm -hmm. You know, um, also enlisted a um, therapist because this shit has been taxing. You know, sure, you know, I've been dealing with it uh, very well, um, and such, but. It's still, you know, I'm still having um, night terrors about losing feet or going blind. You know, it's not fun. Well, yeah, I mean, it's just, you know, some of the long term ramifications of the disease. Obviously, I'm, you know, I'm not going to lose a foot tomorrow or mm -hmm. anything like that. But these are the things you do have to consider when you have diabetes. Um, Anyway, um, that being said, I am healthier than I have been in a good long while. Um, like I said, I went into I went into the doctor's office for some things, and they took my blood pressure. They they actually took my blood sugar there. Um, right now, they said I you know I should take my blood sugar once or twice a day um, before eating to keep uh, tabs on it to, uh, in conjunction with the medication. So I'm really low on the 
keeping tabs on the blood glucose thing. Um, I mean, that, that seems to be the thing. I'm on the, you know, I'm on the low end here. Although, like, the overriding issue was my H1Cs, my hemoglobin count, was really high and had been for a while. Though that's probably also gone, you know. Um, let me get to the overall point. My blood pressure is now normal. My uh, blood sugar was normal. Uh, and I've lost 12 pounds. Um, which is another thing that they want me to do. Um, they want me to lose weight. The thing is, we're not exactly sure about a target weight or anything. It was just kind of a general mandate to weigh less. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but I've been doing that, and I knew, well, I knew that was going to happen by just the virtue of cutting out a lot of unhealthy eating and you know, a lot of sugary drinks. And I will admit, I did partake in a lot of that. And so, not surprised that the weight's been going down. Um, you know, not exactly sure where I'm going to end at here, but it's all early days. Um, so anyway, that's about the gist of where I've been uh, these past two weeks, um, you know, I'm doing fine. I'm doing fine. Um, just it, it's been an adventure. Anyway, so with that in mind, merrily we shall roll along to the interview portion of the broadcast. And joining us uh, once again is Stephen Frost from Digital Eclipse. Hello, everybody. Hello. Uh, how are you doing tonight? Uh, not too shabby. Just trying to survive the, uh, the sort of heat onslaught in California. But um, things are starting to slightly cool down a little bit more. So I think we'll make it. But uh, the last couple of days have been a little bit uh, hot. <laughs> I can imagine. In fact, I don't need to imagine because I live in Florida. and Right. Florida knows hot. That Maybe Florida is usually started. somewhat less on fire, but that's more because everything is damp all the time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think it's one thing if you go in, you're like, okay, I'm just used to hot weather and you deal with it and, or the humidity and you're just like, okay, that's the lifestyle. I'm going to get used to that. But it, it's the ebb and flow and the fluctuations that, that kill, you know, that just like are horrible. Uh huh. Anyway, um, right. So let's see. Where to begin? Where to begin? I suppose before we get into any actual games, I recall last time we had you on the program, you mentioned that you were moving into a new headquarters and you were planning on starting a new uh, podcast production. Uh, so how's all that going? Um, it's actually, Trekulon, we actually just recently, um, uh, shout out to Drew, um, are setting up uh, the equipment and a new streaming PC and the necessary hardware and stuff like that. Um, and that's happening recently. So we're trying to um, get that set up pretty soon so that we can hopefully do sort of a dev-focused stream of Kawabunga Collection and then get a regular schedule where we're streaming stuff one week and then maybe doing a podcast the other week. Um, so it is slowly trucking along. Uh, now that we have the hardware, it just needs to be get, we just need to set it up. Um, we do have a green screen room in the new studio, which is awesome. Um, so we just need to get all that organized and how people are going to sit and the mics, things like that. So uh, hopefully in the very near future, um, it, it was slow to start, unfortunately, uh, due to just the busyness of the studio this last half year, which has just been crazy for us. But um, now that things are, there's a pause uh, for a little bit, um, we're going to get that stuff up and running. And hopefully I'll have um, some good news about that in the uh, coming weeks or so as far as um, our plans for that stuff. Well, that's good to know. And um, and it's it's good that that's finally getting off the ground, so to speak. And you know, you've situated in your new building. Uh, yeah, but, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, as you guys know, just like trying to get a regular schedule to do the stuff and the people and trying to figure <laughs> it out. And we have a lot of people. We just have to figure out, you know, schedule of stuff and and what we're talking about and and how do we how do we make it so that's a regular thing versus like you know doing like two of them and then 
pausing for a month and then, you know, not knowing what's going on. So we'll see. Yeah, we we know how that goes. Um, exactly. But okay. Anyway, and yeah, you brought up the Cowabunga collection, which I also recall we talked about uh, a fair bit last time. But I suppose we should get into this uh, because it is the product of the moment, so to speak. Um, uh, from what I've been seeing, the Cowabunga collection has been doing really well. Like I think it was number three in. Uh, the UK? Yeah, uh, it was. It was just behind um, the, the Last of Us, the, the new PS5 remake, and another Sony title, Horizon, uh, you know, the Horizon sequel. So uh, I, I'll take that. I mean, it's not too shabby to be uh, behind two huge um, Sony titles. Uh, so um, that was a, a pretty great debut. It was nice to see that. Um, we also uh, getting info about just like it on the Nintendo store and and it where it's it, where it's slotting there and and just the sort of um, you know getting the numbers for the initial for the U.S. and the collector's edition, which the collector's edition I think I think across the board uh, from Konami and us, I think I can say that it was a huge success. I mean, I think it kind of blew up and and generated uh, you know a need to kind of reprint them quite a few times i think initially it was only like a they're only going to do one run they weren't sure and then i think they ended up probably doing like you know three four or whatever runs of that because there was such a strong demand uh for that uh collector's edition so um you know thanks to everyone out there for their support uh of the product especially in the in the launch week it sounds like you are pleasantly surprised with the let's say sales reaction to the cowabunga collection well, we we had um, you know a bit of a, uh, an understanding. Like you know, obviously TMNT transcends just games, it, and it transcends a lot of generations. Um, you know, from old to young, uh, they've done a good job of keeping the Turtles IP relevant and con you know constantly updated throughout uh, the years. So it's not like something that's so inherently dated. Like you know, every gen generation sort of has a particular sort of. Uh, view or aspect of Turtles that they've been exposed to, whether it's updated cartoons or the comics or the original games or even recently with Shredder's uh, release earlier this year. Um, so I think that's what kind of helped it. Everyone in their own way has this fondness for the IP. Um, and, you know, that sort of showed out in people trying to, uh, you know, get a taste of that nostalgia and then jump in and play these games again. So I think... After the announcement, I think it was very telling. After that initial announcement, when we unveiled it on the state of play uh, for Sony, um, the reaction out of that was like huge. I think we trended within like five minutes of that show, world, you know, on Twitter. Um, and uh, it was so we knew that something magical and great was happening. But you know, you never wanted to like make assumptions about stuff. But obviously, just the outpouring on social. People posting photos, you know, cosplay stuff and things like that. The Comic Con, the San Diego Comic Con rollout um, was was amazing, and um, you know, now we're sort of, you know, just enjoying kind of that glow that we get when you initially have a release of a product, um, and just taking in all of the the positive energy and the support uh, from everyone who's been sharing their, you know, experiences playing it or just like you know memories of of playing these games originally as a child. Um, and then growing up and playing them again. So it's been kind of a special thing, I think, for both us, uh, you know, the Digital Clips development team, but also the folks at Konami who are, you know, who we dealt with who are amazing and also huge fans of the property. So it's been, it's been wonderful. That's, uh, once again, that's wonderful to hear. Um, one question I do have in regards to those who've been chiming in is of the younger persuasion, because, yeah, you've mentioned that Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles is a franchise that transcends the 80s, mainly because it's actually, you know, outside of, let's say, a few years from the late 90s to 2003, yeah. there's always been, like, a turtle series right. going on. And so I'm wondering if you've been hearing from some of the newer fans of, of the franchise, because... Um, Right now, what's going on with Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles video games is, you know, we're seeing a lot of love going towards the 80s, 
But, right. you know, we're not really seeing a lot of stuff for, say, Rise of the Teenage Ninja Turtles. So I- I'm wondering right. how... Uh, so have you heard from, you know, people who might be fans of that uh, particular show? And have they played, you know, the Cowabunga Collection? Yeah, I mean, we don't... I haven't seen anything specific where people are calling out shows and stuff. There's a lot of... Um, what I'm seeing, I mean, a ton of what I'm seeing is where parents are playing with their kids. Um, because the parents have, obviously, the, the nostalgia for the properties, and the kids may be exposed to it via uh, new cartoons or, you know, Netflix shows or whatever, um, uh, or comics, right? Um, and they know the brand and stuff like that, and it's sort of like this opportunity for family bonding over uh, a sort of a classic kind of gaming experience, which is, you know, far and few between, I think, these days, uh, a lot of times. Um, so um, I wouldn't say that we necessarily, obviously, because of social, get a lot from kids or younger age folks. But what we do get a lot of is uh, people sharing photos and just saying thanks for uh, an experience where they can sit down and play it with their family as a whole, right? Um, and mm-hmm. that's that sort of thing. So that's been that's been great to to kind of hear. Indeed, I'm like, and it does make sense since when this is a collection that ostensibly caters to the old school, like right. Um, as far as on a personal note, have you played had the chance to play Shredder's Revenge yet? Yeah, we we did play that uh, early on um, when it when it first came out, um, and you know have continuously like it's funny, even the, you know the people um, who are in our studio who developed who didn't work on Cowboy Collection, you know because we're always talking about turtles right now and things like that, uh, turtles and Atari amongst other things. But um, you know I'm always suggesting them to to try out Shredder's Revenge because a lot of people in the company are kind of old school kind of brawler uh, uh, fans. And and I'm not saying old school from the standpoint that they may have played them years ago or when they were younger, but that type of gameplay, there's actually a fair number of folks in the studio who actually like that kind of gameplay and are always looking for um, new games that sort of capture that regardless sort of IP. So I've actually ended up, you know, recommending Shredders to like folks who don't even traditionally play Turtles games because it is a very classic feel um, sort of brawler experience, right? And like a significant number of the games in the collection are the games that that is basically based on. Right. Yeah. Definitely. And and that's the that's the sort of thing. Like I think we're, you know, they are sort of making this kind of celebration of the all the parts of turtles and kind of kind of distilling that into a singular experience. Where I think we're sort of like. Uh, you know, celebrating sort of the nostalgia and sort of the history of the turtles, right? The sort of very two different products that kind of uh, it is great that they actually kind of launched this year the same, you know, roughly in the same time frame that um, uh, people could uh, get a chance to enjoy them both because I think they do complement each other quite a bit. Hmm. And let me see. Uh, so, have you had to do any particular? amount of bug fixing or patchwork on the Cowabunga collection since release? Uh, yeah, we, I mean, you can say that for every release. I mean, there's not a single, in fact, I mean, I can't imagine a single game release this, these, these days that doesn't, you know, where like it's the, the, sh- the first initial ship date is the end of it, right? That's almost viewed as the beginning of things a lot of times. Um, so yeah, of course, just like in every collection, uh, our, stand- our standard protocol is, you know, it goes out, um, we generally always, for the most part, have a, a sort of a day one patch that um, tries to fix a lot of the little things that we notice at the last minute. The thing about digital Eclipse stuff is that we always that we always try to pack in as much stuff as we can up to the last possible moment. Um, and oftentimes, to our unfortunate challenge, some of our best ideas or things boil up at the top at the very end. And so there's oftentimes, because we want the experience to be the best that it can, you know, a sane (laughs) producer would probably say, you know, let's, we're not going to put that in the product, you know, it's, it's, it's sort of out of scope, or it's too late. Um, You know, we're just not going to do it. But we are all sort of very passionate fans about delivering to the end user and also especially in the relation of turtles extremely huge fans of the turtle franchise um and just want to do 
the most that we can do. And so we were squeezing stuff into that collection, same as Atari, up until literally the last possible moment. Um, and unfortunately, that can introduce some bugs or, or you're trying to fix things and things get slipped through. Um, so what we end up doing after that is, you know, we spend the, the first few weeks after launch and we, we take all the feedback that people send us and we get all the feedback from our publisher, in this case, Konami, um, you know, who, who gets feedbacks and comments through their support lines. And then we kind of put them all together and start kind of going through them and, and sort of seeing, you know, what are the key issues? Uh, what are the issues that would improve the experience for the most majority of people? And is it something that's uh, possible within a timely manner that we can try to get out another update for this within a reasonable amount of time? Because obviously, you know, submission time frames, pushing it out to people, it all takes time. So it's all these little factors that that work into that. But yeah, to answer your question, just like every collection, Cowabunga is no different. Uh, we're going through and evaluating all the, uh, the the various issues, some of which we caught also at the very tail end and didn't get a chance to fix. Um, and then kind of sort of going through there and, and seeing what makes sense to address in a timely manner. Yeah, like uh, I heard that one of the strategy guides in the PlayStation 4 version, at least, isn't working properly. Um, uh, I think I'm not aware of that bug. I know that there is a bug in the strategy guide where there's like a duplicate screenshot, but I haven't seen um any issues pertaining to nothing working i mean i was i was just looking at the playstation 4 build just yesterday again so i don't i don't I know i think uh, it's for the genesis tournament fighters like uh, ah, so i know what the issue is for that it's because and this is something that we sort of failed on and, and we're going to try to improve it but uh the genesis and the nes tournament fighter strategy guys are the same they're basically they're on the same page like two pages so I think what people are assuming is that when they go in for one prop like game like Genesis or Nintendo or whatever, they see the other platform there as part of the page and they probably get confused. Um, so that was unfortunately an issue where like the strategy guy, we weren't able to fully complete uh, to the level that we wanted the Genesis versions and the NES versions of Tournament Fighter. So we're, that's one of the um, things that we're hoping to improve in a patch. Okay. And I suppose this is a good uh, point to delineate in a bit with the strategy guys, because I think this is like the big new thing you've added to the whole retro collection mix. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I, you know, as with, you know, I kind of stated earlier, like with every digital clips collection, we do try to surpass the previous and that has gotten to be very challenging, especially with the double whammy of turtles and Atari. Uh, just huge amount of efforts by the team on both sides. I mean, I, I hope people, uh, you know, know it when they see it. They've seen it for Turtles. I think when Atari comes out, I think it's going to blow some people's minds when they see that because Turtles was a labor of love uh, for obviously the Turtles IP. The uh, Atari 50 is a labor of love for Atari fans and that 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 generation of gaming. So I think you'll see the attention to detail that went there, which is staggering. But um, going back to um, sort of your point yes we always try to do something new whenever it makes sense right like we're not gonna just throw in a feature willy-nilly if it doesn't make sense um but we felt that since turtles is such a nostalgic property um we really wanted to capture that in every aspect of the collection including like the turtles lair where you go into the museum and so the idea of these strategy guides came up because, you know, that's what you had back in the days, the Nintendo powers or other things. And you, you didn't have the internet. You kind of went around and looked at these strategy guides or people shared issues of Nintendo power or what other gaming magazines were there, you know? Mm. Um, and so that's such a, a memorable aspect of a lot of people's gaming childhoods, right? Spreading out the maps to Zelda or whatever it is. Right. Um, so we wanted to sort of capture that nostalgia and that that sort of memory thing um, component um, in, in in an interesting way, and, and strategy guide sort of made sense for that. Uh, but of course, digital clips being digital clips, we're never happy with just putting together strategy guides. So what we ended up doing, like, what's our twist on strategy guides? Because people can just do strategy guides. Um, uh, they haven't really yet. But um, what we went in there and did is we took our sort of watch movie technology which allows you to watch you know a playthrough of the, the game um, and then we use sections of that in the strategy guide so that when you read a tip 
for the ones that need sort of visual kind of reinforcement, um, you can click a button and it will load the, the watch movie sequence for that trick or that code or that strategy um, so that you could watch it as well. Um, so uh, we thought that that was a kind of a modern twist on sort of a classic idea of strategy guides. And it seems to be resonating with a lot of people. Um, you know, such as even, even the same thing with the watch movies, like uh, Turtles has brought a ton of new people into the Digital Eclipse family as far as, you know, um, seeing what we're doing and, and the, the company as a whole and sort of the talent, and the passion that our teams have. And so for a lot of them, this is new. Everything is new as far as Digital Eclipse. So that's why I think even the watch movies got a lot of attention, even though we've done that before in previous releases. Mm. For a lot of people, this is their first kind of foray into digital clips land. And so they're seeing that they're like, what kind of weird wizardry and magic is this where I can watch a, a playthrough of this game and then at any time jump in and play it. And um, so, um, you know, we always like to add those things. And, you know, to go back to your question, the strategy guides was something that really resonated and, and kind of boiled to the top as far as something that would capture that magic of nostalgia. And we just wanted to do a little bit of a twist of digital clips on it. And that's sort of how it came to pass. Yeah. I mean, if it makes them feel any better, we did have that of a sort in, in you know, 89, 90. With, um, I remember seeing a lot of these at the local Blockbuster, the Game Player's Guide tapes. And I remember this yeah. one pretty commonly, Ultra Games, which had first game, Teenage Ninja Turtles. Right. Like, uh, yeah, I mean, this is, the, this is the kind of thing you did back then. You... you could go and watch a playthrough on VHS yep. recorded quote unquote professionally. Like I just find that very amusing. And yeah, I mean that's is, yeah. I mean that's sort of, sorry to interrupt, but like that's sort of how we view it. Like the thing is we're just fans. You know, really bar none, like we're just fans. We get the pleasure and the and the awesome opportunities to work on these properties, but really at the bottom we're just fans. And so we think about it from the perspective of what would fans want for this particular collection. I think that's how um, a lot of these ideas come about. Um, I think in, you know, in not all cases, but I think a lot of cases where these sort of quote unquote retro collections get released, it's just either a bunch of games and a packaging with very little thought into it. And I think the fault of the problem there is that the people who, uh, you know, I'm sort of like pigeonholing a little bit, but I think in those cases, the people who are working on those collections are not fans of the things that are being put in that collection. Um, and so it's kind of like a job or it's kind of like, OK, what do I need to do? I need to put eight games into a collection with some art. I can do that. But they don't really care about the source material, per se. They don't want to learn more about it because they don't have an invested interest in it. Whereas I feel on the digital clip side, if I were to, you know, sort of toot our own horn a little bit, is that we take on properties that we are individually very passionate about and fans of. And so there's just an internal drive on our own to seek out like more information and what is the behind the scenes stuff. And, you know, I saw an advertisement 10 years ago. Where is that advertisement? Can we get that advertisement? Where can we get that advertisement? Right. I don't think most people think like that. Um, and um, we work hard on that stuff. So I think that's how, you know, when you, when you point to like the VHS tapes, which I'm very well aware of as far as the recording of the playthroughs that were sent out or like the strategy guides you found in Barnes and Noble mm -hmm. or, K you know, the bookstores back right. in the day, we're trying to recapture that because we're just fans of that whole thing. Yeah. Um, anyway, so we should probably move on to the other collection here, um, given the time. And that is Atari 50, the anniversary celebration. Now, right. yeah, so you want to talk about collections and compilations and what have you. Atari games are no stranger to that. In fact, I think some of the first like Digital Eclipse branded titles might have been on Atari games of one sort or another. Yes, the, in the early days, for sure, um, we were some of the first, or I wasn't there, obviously, but the company was some of the first to, to take, you know, emulation to sort of, you know, like the public as far as retail products and stuff like that. And Atari and the Atari stuff was definitely a part of that um, back in the day. Yeah. And once again, Atari has also seen a number of compilations over the years, but this one's a bit different. 
And, uh, well, if, for those who might not know, uh, this is actually a celebration of the entirety of Atari. Because, okay, w when we talk about Atari collections and retro compilations and all that, where does it always land? The 2600. Right. It, it's like Sega and the Genesis. Uh, it, you know, the 2600 landmark system, all that stuff, um, most popular Atari thing by far, but it's also... Atari is so much more than the 2600, and I think this is what this collection is aiming to do. Yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, in a weird way, the 2600 is like your entry fee to get into the club. Um, like, you have to do 2600, even though it's been done a lot. Like, you couldn't do a, an Atari collection without 2600 games. That would just be, I think, crazy. It's such an important aspect um, of Atari's rich history. Um, and it has a ton of games for the platform. Um, so you kind of have to do that because it does represent a significant history in Atari. And it is sort of the thing that most people, when they think of Atari, they think of the 2600 in a lot of ways. Um, 2600, it's still not, I mean, it's been done a lot in various releases, um, the flashback uh, console stuff and things like that. But it's still not easy. I mean, I don't want, you know, people get used to it because they still see a lot of 2600 stuff and they're like, oh, okay, whatever, it's 2600. But, you know, when we go in, like, you still have to, like, set things up, especially if we're, this is our first time sort of in recent history doing a lot of new Atari emulation. And this collection has the most new emulators uh, ever of any digital clips collection by far. They're, all, they're, they're basically almost all new. Um, and if they're not new as in being developed for this collection, they're new to us as far as working with the people. So from that regard, they're pretty much all new. Um, so 2600 is still not easy from the standpoint because you have to set up all the game variations, um, which most people forget about because they think about the simple gameplay and the graphics. But like some of these games have 52, if not more, game variations to them. Um, and so you have to still work out the details of like, how do you, you allow people to toggle 50 plus game variations and how do you message that to them and how do you get it to work in an intuitive way and things like that? So you, there's still all this work with 2600, even though that is the cover charge to get in the door, right? And that's still going to take you a fair bit of time to do, especially with accuracy, with analog controls and all the other stuff. But <laughs> that's still a fair amount of time. And then when you get into the club, there's a whole other level of expectations, right? Um, there's all other platforms that you need to try to cover. Uh, which ones are the important ones in order to accurately represent the 50 years of Atari? And I sort of tweeted this previously, and it's a true point that normally in a digital clips collection, we have a very clear, you know, outside of like weird extraneous uh, like features and stuff like the strategy guides or whatever, like we go into development knowing like what the game list is going to be, the key features and things like that. This product was very different because we wanted to really focus on the historic significance of Atari. So for the first time, really, and I think in recent Digital Clips history, the games are not the top billing um, per se. It is the history of Atari that is the top billing and how that's represented. So when you go into our game and compared to other things, like if you boot into TMNT or you boot into any other collection, Aladdin, whatever, the first thing that you generally come across are the games. Like, that's the first thing you see. Um, in Atari, games are not the first thing that you come to. Um, so you can easily access them at any time, but they aren't the first thing that you come across. Um, so, um, so the key things there, of course, going in is, and the point I'm sort of making is that during the course of development, we had to keep adding new platforms, emulation platforms, new games, um, you know, new aspects to the collection because we were building a living story. And at the beginning, it's not written yet. Um, it's as you go along and you write it and you figure out what are the key things in Atari's history that we need to focus on and talk about. So it may be, you know, the obvious stuff like adventure or, or other things, but it may be little known factoids. And then you say like, okay, I really want to talk about this. How do we support this with the games or videos or art and things like that. And so this project, more so than in any other project, really grew in scope and scale during development. Um, even, and you might have seen this, even from the original announcement um, trailer, launch trailer, the trailer says it's like, you know, more than I think 90 games. I can't remember if it says more than 80 games or more than 90 games. But even since that point, it's it's now more than 100 games, right? Since when it's released, it'll be more than 100 games. Um, so 
even in that short amount of time from the trailer to when the the point that we submitted the game the collection to first parties and we had it locked we were adding games to it uh, all the way up until the last minute um, and I guess, you know, that's, again, that's to sh- kind of show that we are trying to focus on the story, the history of Atari, and you, we really need to make sure that you have the games in there to support that. Cause we don't want to talk about a game and not include it uh, unless there's a specific reason that we can't. Right. Um, right. so that's a little bit kind of different from previous D collections, but yeah, to your point, there's 2600 is you still have to do it. But now we've expanded and we started introducing new stuff in a retail packaging, such as the Jaguar um, emulation, right? So, Right. And that, I think, is another selling point um, because I'm not saying, like, it looks like pretty much every major Atari uh, console is being represented here. And I think uh, what is it? One of the Atari computers uh, is going to be in this, and you've got the arcade stuff. So it's right. pretty comprehensive uh, docket of Atari history. Like, yeah, and that's never been done before. Yeah, and I think that's also why, even from the name, like it doesn't say collection in the title. This is celebration um, mm-hmm. because it's not just a collection. And we didn't want people to think that this was just another Atari collection. And that's very deliberate in how we did things. Like I said, how when you start the game, you, the first the, the things when you go in there, you, you don't see the games uh, as the first thing. Um, so the view and our sort of approach to this was very, very different. Like we did not want it to come across as just a normal collection, even in comparison to other past DE collections. Um, so that was very conscious decision as far as the title, the look of it, the the flow of the UI when you go into it. And again, you know, we we want to make sure that people can access these games at any time. And you can, no matter where you are in the collection, you can access the games uh, with a push of a button, anytime, anywhere. So the games are always there. They just aren't necessarily the key focus of it. Um, the the key focus of this is sort of our journey as we take you from sort of the beginning uh, of, of Atari's sort of existence and teach you about all of this stuff um, through videos. You know, we recorded so much video for this. I think it's the most video we've ever recorded for a collection. Um, video, we dug through everything to find uh, photos and artwork and imagery. Um, and that combined with the the games themselves so that you can if you're reading about a game you can just launch it real quick and just play it for 10 seconds and then jump back and then continue your adventure and i think that was key because i think even if um you aren't you know a huge fan of atari or it didn't have as much meaning to you as a lot of as it did to a lot of us at the company i think from a historical educational reference this collection will teach people a lot. And I think the presentation, which I kind of equated to kind of a museum sort of scenario, like I imagine like when you walk into a museum display um, on a particular topic, there's all this different ephemera and videos and things that you can walk to and you can choose what you want to see. Like, I want to go see that video or this is an interactive component of it or this is reading or this is looking at artwork. You can sort of do all that in your journey um, and jump around uh, if you want. And like I said, I, I think I... I kind of joked with you last time, but there is a point where we do track your progress through your journey uh, through the history of Atari, uh, and it's for a specific reason. So every every time you go in, you will see there's a percentage and there's a little you know effect that happens when you interact with stuff, um, and you know something will happen when you get to a certain point. Um, so um, yeah, I think we just kind of viewed it from that sort of museum kind of celebratory perspective and not we came at it from the back end versus kind of like oh this is just a collection of games how many games can we squeeze in here right um the the game choices are for the most part very deliberate and we handpicked the things that were in here um to sort of convey certain things that we wanted to convey so right i mean there's so much here um 
And we'll definitely have to have you back on the program uh, when this collection is closer to release. Right. Because, you know, 100 games is a lot. But even not getting into the 100 games, um, there's questions like you're emulating stuff like the 5200 and the Jaguar, which yeah. are renowned for having very complicated uh, controllers. Yes. And uh, how are you handling the transposition of, you know, a Jaguar controller, which had, you know, is, let's say a standard three or six button uh, configuration with basically a phone pad? And, yeah. you know, how, how do you control that with an Xbox controller? Yeah, that's a very good question. And, you know, it's always funny when we talk about Jaguar emulation and things like that, people always, the first thing that jumps to mind is like, well, how the heck did they handle all the buttons? And, and all I say to them is, that's a very good question. But you'll have, right. to, you have to wait and see. Um, but yeah, we spent some time thinking about that. And I think we came up with a way um, that is intuitive uh, and makes sense within the context of the, the games in the collection. Um, so, you know, we'll see what people think about it as we reveal more of when they get hands on to it. But I, I think we came up with a, a pretty elegant and fast sort of way to, to handle that. Okay. Because I'll add on to that because um, there's another console I can think of where that thing has come up and it's not being good. And that's the Intellivision. Because the Intellivision had a similar kind of setup mm -hmm. and that seen retro compilations and. Uh, let's just say emulating a an Intellivision controller with, you know, like a PlayStation Two controller was awkward. Um, yeah, that might I, yeah, be the yeah, understatement of the sure. year. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, we we spent a lot of time thinking about that stuff. Um, that's one of those in your face things that you kind of have to solve. But there's a lot of other things. Um, if I could only share how much time. Uh, we spent on just things like analog controls for the arcade games and individual platforms and how it feels and trying to replicate the feel of the arcade in a home console. And it's like a staggering amount of like just sitting there iterating over and over and over and over and over and over again. Um, people won't, people won't um, say anything because it's either it feels right or it doesn't. And, and that's the expectation. But, you know, it's, it's oftentimes like, how do you take a, a spinner or, 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 a, or, you know, a trackball experience or things like that? And how does that, in a way, intuitively um, sort of map to a modern controller, right? What are the things that you can sort of do in order to make that a better experience? And, and one of the things, you know, I can say is that the number of controller options and analog setting options in this collection is like substantially more than any other digital eclipse collection like it's not even close um we spent a lot of time trying to make sure the controls are very good um and again it's one of those things where like i don't want to you know point to any specific collections or people's you know they just kind of put it in a box and they kind of make sure it works and that it's okay and then that's where they call it a day whereas that's that moment, as I say, when the games are just running and working well and accurately and everything like that, that's sort of like us getting out of bed. Um, <laughs> and then, then the rest of the day is like, how do we improve upon that uh, aspect of it? Um, and that's where the, the difficulty comes in um, and the challenges. And like even like um, things like the, the bezels for the arcade and, and what do they look like and, and, and how, how do... How do the lights in those for certain games work uh, in relation to the game to message people things and things like that? So there, there's a lot. I, I think there's going to be a lot of people to digest. Um, it's sort of similar to Turtles where I get a lot of tweets where uh, people like they, they don't even play the game the first day. You know, they open it up and they just spent the first day just looking at the museum. Right. Um, and just looking at the content. And then they spend the, then they do the game the next day. I, I think this is going to be. Uh, a similar situation where people are jumping around, but I think once they see the sheer amount of of stuff in here and the attention to detail, I think they're just going to want to absorb it all and just look at it all and kind of go through it all and and you know be less about the games and more about the experience of it, right? So, right. 
And speaking of such things, so not only do we have the 100 or so legacy games, but this is being stuffed with uh, six new games. Um, yes, and there's actually, that has increased to a degree uh, as well, just similar to the other ones. We've only sort of said six full because those are full experiences, but there are um, there are more kind of enhanced or sort of different things that we have not mentioned yet um, oh. that are, are in that. And it's a similar boat where the game list kept increasing. Um, you get to a point where like, oh, you know, doing this would be really cool. And we're like, oh, uh, should we do it? And we're like, well, I think people would really appreciate it. And so we sit down and we do it, right? Um, so there are a couple things that um, uh, that I think people will be surprised at. I'm sure they'll be revealed. We're planning like sort of like how we roll out more information about things and from marketing perspective and stuff like that as we get head towards launch. Um, but yeah, there's there's still the, the, the six core kind of games and then there's there's value add. There's some more. Like prototypes? Uh, no. No. There, imagine, if you will, like, in building, like, you know, there's, there's, for the six new games, they fall into a variety of categories, right? Vector Sector is sort of like a celebration or an homage of, like, vector-based arcade games. And so it's a mish, it's like a mashup, right? Um, Haunted Houses is sort of like what is kind of a more modern twist on Haunted Houses. So that's very different from Vector Sector. Um, Air World is like, we finished the series. So this, that's like, you know, what What would be the 2600 uh, game B if we could actually finish Air World? And so we did that. So that's very different from the other two. Um, and then Quadra Tank is sort of like taking the best parts of like the tank parts of combat and the tank arcade game and making it even greater multiplayer, um, you know, and making that a party experience, uh, like couch co-op and competitive experience, right? Um, and so that's different from the other four things. And then the sixth thing um, is Yar's Revenge, which is basically similar to what you've seen with like the um, Wonder Boy stuff, where basically like we run the emulation of Yar's Revenge underneath it, but at any point you can press the button and it gets a fresh coat of paint. Um, so it's got modernized kind of graphics that you can turn off and on uh, to see that, oh, look, this is actually the original Yars running in the background. We're just making it look better. So what I'm really proud of is that it's six new things, but they're very different experiences. So the other bonus stuff, again, are very different experiences from the six that I just talked about. That's interesting, if nothing else. Like yeah. The key thing was like making everything a unique thing. We didn't want to just say, make like okay we're doing four games that are just like oh what's a, a modern kind of telling of it we we wanted to do different types of games right that's what people want to sort of see and, and different sort of experiences tailored to the to the thing so um that's what they have like it's not just six new games it's like six very different types of games uh included in the collections plus some more mm -hmm. and do any of these games have basis in the past, or are they completely new thing? Uh, which ones? The ones I talked about, or yeah, the the, the six new ones. The, they're all new experiences, just yeah. invoking the retro spirit. Yeah, they, like I said, they all kind of cater to the specific things I called out, but they're all brand, you know, brand new experiences. Right. Okay, that makes sense. And let me see here. Uh, so, on the flip side of the coin. Were you disappointed in any aspects of Atari that might have been, let's say, off limits? Um, I think uh, the case, the, the same case with every collection that we do when we try to uh, figure out games lists or things we can talk about and stuff like that, um, there's always going to be some licensing stuff um, or, um, uh, you know, or issues with uncertainty. I think the biggest thing, and I think I talked about this last time, but I, I talked about it a lot, is that it's less necessarily due about the legal situation. It's more about the uncertainty of the legal situation, because a lot of this time, a lot of time has passed, and you can get a lot of scenarios where you don't know who owns something. Like, you I'm literally don't sure know. I'm pretty sure Stephen Kick could talk your ear off about this one. Right, right. So, <laughs> and it's a very problematic situation, because if you can't point a finger at who owns this, you can't really include it, uh, you know? So, so that's a lot of research work. So that's our biggest sort of thorn in our side is like, 
oh, this would be awesome. And you try to like track it, like who owns it or who potentially owns it. And you reach out and you talk to people and then you just can't figure it out. So you can't include it. So there's obviously selections of games that we would have wanted to include that we couldn't either through the fact that we just don't know who is the correct, you know, property owner or IP owner mm -hmm. decade, decades later. The other thing is like, well, you know, this is the first kind of release of this uh, celebration. We don't know if it's going to be more. Obviously, we would have loved to include a, a greater number of like third party uh, games, um, you know, the well, Activision stuff and things like that, that help to define Atari. Um, but in today's climate, stuff like that, and sort of the time challenges that we had with this collection to just get the hundred plus games done, um, you know, I think there was always a desire to try to include even more games um, that that we all selectively wanted from different companies and things like that. So um, I think that's probably the biggest kind of thing. Um, the other thing too is that um, it's always a time thing, but um, people won't notice know it, but because there will be a day one patch, but maybe people will explore, but there's actually a lot of cool stuff, like even functionality and stuff that we're adding for the day one patch for this. Um, and um, we just, we weren't planning to do it originally, or we just ran out of time more so or not, we weren't planning to do it. And then we decided let's do it because it improves the product and stuff like that. So I think there's going to be even more <laughs> value add. Like, like I said, when people get it and they download the patch, it's not, it's just going to be the day one experience to them. But you know, if you were to compare the, the two, you'll notice that there's some cool new features and quality of life stuff that uh, we've done for the patch. So, okay, and uh, let me see here. So, how many games have been revealed that aren't the six new ones uh, so far? Like in the whole collection? Yeah, like um, oh, what's I don't, out I, there. What's I don't know. Out in terms of like. You know, what Jaguar games and Lynx games and 5200 games are coming to the uh, Atari 50 collection? Yeah, I mean, I think only, like, Jaguar-wise, you know, I'd have to look at the video. Because I think people's only exposure to it is, like, maybe, like, the brief glimpse in the, in the trailer, the launch trailer, or the announcement trailer. Mm -hmm. And then maybe, like, a screenshot. So maybe they have, like, you know, maybe they have, like... I'm guessing here, maybe like half of them have been revealed. I'd have to look at it again. Um, same I mean, thing yeah. with links. Links, I'd have to see, you know, look at the trailer again, like what has been leaked. But there is this guy on, <laughs> there, I should look at it. There's actually a guy on YouTube and all he does is whenever there is some sort of more information about a game, he adds to this video. And basically the video is just him showing screenshots of every single game that is included in the collection. And he just keeps adding to it. Um, so that's probably your most accurate <laughs> representation of what has been revealed. Um, it's hard for us to keep track because, um, you know, screenshots get released all the time and it's hard to, you know, keep track of like what has been revealed in those screenshots, at least from us, from the developer team, right? I'm sure Atari marketing have a whole game plan for that, but. I'd imagine, I'm like, and do you know when like the next reveal event or whatever is scheduled to be planned? I don't know that. We are um, talking more closely um, uh, with Atari's marketing teams now to figure that sort of out. So I think it would be very soon. I mean, we're only a couple months out from the launch. So I expect things are going to heat up very, uh, very soon. Um, and I think what we'll try to do is maybe do a little bit more to spotlight the new games as an example, um, um, as well as obviously things like the Jaguar and some of the cool features uh, that us, you know, uh, crazy people at Digital Clips like to add to these collections for authenticity. Um, you know, calling out some of that stuff because it's kind of amazing work by some of our engineers, quite honestly. Um, so I, I hope in the very near future, you know, maybe starting later this month, I, I'm hopeful that more stuff and information will um, be coming out. But I can't, I don't know yet because we're just starting our discussions with uh, the marketing team about the rollout of stuff. Of course. And what do you feel is uh, being pushed with this particular collection from, you know, Digital Eclipse? You know, what's the, what's the notch here that puts this um, in your, you know, your, 
you mentioned your every collection has to like either top or do something new or you know, right. And in your estimation, what does this one do? I think it does a lot. I mean, it, in a bare sense, it's sort of like from a asset size and just content wise, it's, it's probably the biggest. Um, I mean, it's. It, for, I mean, this is like, you know, uh, Turtles was so big that we had a search engine in it. Like we added a search engine to it, um, which mm -hmm. is telling, I feel. Um, so from a 2D, as, like a traditional like art asset and imagery stuff, uh, Turtles has a ton. But, you know, um, Atari has a ton mixture of like things like new movies, you know, artwork, boxes, um, even the even the boxes we've made into 3D models so that you can rotate them and look at them if you want to. Um, so it's the mixture of assets is probably the greatest that sort of uh, we ever done um, uh, as far as mixing all those different media types together for sure. Um, and then I think the biggest change in this collection really is the presentation of it. Um, like I said, we came in this treating it like a celebration, not a collection. Um, and so while the games are important, they help to tell the story. Um, they aren't necessarily, the, the spotlight's not just on them. Um, so I think when people see this and they go through sort of like the the experience of the history of Atari and see that, you know, you're as they're going through like, oh, I can watch this video or I can interact with this or I can just launch the game and play it. I think that's a new experience across the board for releases like this. The whole idea of being able to interact with stuff uh, instantaneously uh, especially games, um, just to see what it's like and then jump back in and then continue the story, right? Um, that's kind of new for us, and I think that's sort of the kind of the big thing. And then obviously from a game perspective, this is the most uh, number of games that we've ever included in a collection. It's like gigantic. Uh, the amount of work to get all those games uh, in this collection and working accurately with the features that they need and feeling good with the con different controllers and all that stuff... Um, that was a huge undertaking. Um, and then lastly, of course, not only with all the work that was already being done with the new presentation, the largest number of games for our collections, the largest amount of like different multimedia that we've ever done, let's even add more to that. And that's, you know, that's adding six plus more games, new games that we made. So I think in all those things, those are the bullet points that kind of add up. Like this is the most number of new games we ever made for collection. It's the most number of games we ever included in collection. It's the most number of like varied, I think, multimedia sort of assets that we've ever included in collection. And the presentation is completely new for Digital Clips. So, you know, almost in every regard, it's it's kind of a new and different experience from Digital Clips. I, I suppose the worry here is trying to top this collection then. Yes, um, and that's, that's, <laughs> that's what I think about now, Dave. That's what I think about now, right? Um, but there's the thing, you know, sometimes the scope of, of collections don't necessarily need to be as big as they are, right? Like, this collection needed to celebrate 50 years of Atari, so it needs mm -hmm. to be pretty robust, right? Um, same thing as Turtles... Uh, you've got 13 games uh, uh, as far as English version games. Um, there's a wealth of time that has passed since those games and, and a lot of behind the scenes content that has never been seen before. So that was sort of important to do. But, you know, our next collection may not be to that, you know, it may not be that. It might be something that's simpler or more down to earth because of the needs of it, right? Um, so, um, but we'll always try to do something unique and interesting to it uh, whenever possible or fun or a different twist on it and stuff like that. So, you know, I guess I don't view it as like trying to top something just because of sheer scope and size, but more about like trying to approach it from a different view, you know, viewing angle and see what kind of fun stuff we can do based off of the types of games and material that we're trying to present. And that's how we always try to continue to improve. All right. Well, um... As always, it's been wonderful talking with you, but uh, I do have to cut things off here because, well, um, we have run very long. No and, worries. well, it's more we have to get prepared for the next show happening <laughs> in about 20 minutes. Like, we, we run two sh shows on uh, Wednesday. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Um, but, you know, um, once again, it was wonderful having you on the program. We'll definitely have you on again. 
um, when the Atari 50 is, um, celebration is like close or released because, yeah. you know, we, we've talked a lot about the games in generality. Yeah. And such, but, you know, there's clearly a lot we can't dig into because of NDA stuff. And, you know, I, I am looking forward to like delving into like answer, actually answering the some of the emulation questions that can't be answered right now. Right. So, right. Right. Um, yeah, for sure. Yeah, more than happy to jump on with that stuff. There's going to be a ton of stuff to be talk. You know, to talk about that collection. It's it's huge. So, um, yeah. Uh, thanks. Thanks for having me on, and uh, definitely uh, would love to chit chat more about uh, Atari when we can talk a, a bit more about. Uh, some of the cool stuff. Uh, no problem. No problem. Um, once again, uh, pr I'll probably be in touch, you know, sometime when the like release date gets announced. So, anyway, uh, but until then, uh, the games are the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Cowabunga Collection, which you can get on your digital platform of choice. Um, or when is the collector's edition getting reprinted and uh, going to be available again? For which one? I'm sorry. Uh, the Cowabunga collection. Oh, I think. I mean, I think now it's done. I mean, it's, it was. It was sort of like reprinted okay. during the lead up to okay. the uh, to the release. Like we had it early, and then it sold out, and then I think it sold out again, ah, and then I think it sold out again. Um, and so I don't know how many times they ended up increasing the count for it, but um, yeah, I, I at this point I. I mean, don't quote me on, but I don't think that they're making any more. I think that's it. Um, so okay. um, if it's available, if you know, if there's some lingering stock somewhere, which would I'd be surprised at. If there's some lingering stock there and you're somewhat interested, I would grab it um, because it's it's definitely going to go away. Uh, yes, um, and Atari uh, Fifty uh, is also, I think, at the very least, available on Steam for pre-order or for wish listing. Yeah, there's yeah, physical. Too. There's a steel book that um, I think Best Buy uh, has. I don't know if it's expanded beyond there, but I think they have the first. So there is actually for Switch a steel book special edition of Atari 50 um, that comes with a poster and, of course, a cool steel book. Um, so for those of you who are, um, you know, Atari fans and love the Switch, uh, that's a cool thing. And I think it's only $10 more. I think it's with the steel book and poster, I think it's $50. And I think the regular. Uh, game by itself is forty dollars, so it's just a ten dollar um, charge, I guess, for the stuff. Okay, all right, but yeah, you can pre-order that now, and you know, obviously, get it when it uh, gets released sometime in winter of twenty twenty-two. Right. So yeah, that'll about do it for this installment of Fragments of Silicon. Apologies that we didn't get to a topic of discussion this week. Sometimes that happens, but, uh, you know, we'll, we'll be talking about the Genesis uh, Mini 2 next week. Um, anyway, so the week ahead, uh, about 20, no, sorry, about 15 minutes, we'll be uh, hopefully going into a new episode of Moonhawk Studios Presents. Uh, on Friday, September 9th, we'll be having a uh, Hosin Akbari uh, and Majid Re uh, Ramani of Black Cube Games. Uh, apologies for butchering those names. Um, but uh, they are the developers of the game The Tale of the Um I think that's how that that's how that's pronounced. You know how I, I go with um, foreign names. But um, yes, th uh, this is an action adventure game uh, based off of a 12th century Persian poem. It's been interesting playing through it. Um, and we'll be talking about it on Friday. And coming up on the Sunday game reviews, uh, we'll be having reviews and impressions of Vampire Survivors, Way of the Hunter, Dynabomb 2, and Bounder. So. Well, until whichever show you plan on checking on next, I shall wish you good gaming.